don't assume central banks are stupid. That's a lesson I've learned. Assume that they know what they've got to do. If the game is, we need to roll $10 trillion of debt this year, and the Europeans have to, and the Chinese have to, and the Japanese have to, and everybody else, the best single thing would be to lock that in for another four years at the lowest possible rates. So it's kind of like, maybe there is a game here, which is to undershoot. I've observed that they're all in cahoots with each other, all of the central banks, plus all of the government. I kind of think if they're doing it late, they're doing it on purpose because they're not stupid. They can see the same models. What? My work is better than all of the people at the Fed? No, they're choosing to do it for a reason. Earlier today, Bitcoin prices fell below $58,000 for the first time in two months, reaching a low of $57,168 according to data from CoinMarketCap. This sell-off was triggered by activity on wallets associated with the defunct crypto exchange MTGOX and the German Federal Criminal Police Office, which moved approximately $175 million worth of Bitcoin to crypto exchanges Coinbase and Kraken, as well as over-the-counter desks. Late last month, the defunct exchange's rehabilitation trustee announced plans to start distributing assets stolen in the 2014 hack. The announcement, made on the exchange's website, stated that payments would be made in Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash prompting analysts to warn of potential selling pressure on both cryptocurrencies, albeit temporarily. Blockchain analytics firm Markham revealed that MTGOX conducted test transactions earlier today, moving about $25 worth of Bitcoin across three transactions to different wallets. This test could indicate an intention to begin the redistribution process, as entities with large crypto holdings often conduct small test transactions before making larger transfers. This news has caused turbulence in the cryptocurrency markets with the CMC Crypto Fear and Greed Index falling to 45, its lowest point in 2024. The overall crypto market cap is also at multi-month lows amidst this turbulence and sell-off. Amidst the market volatility, Real Vision founder and CEO Ro Pal provided his updated outlook for the cryptocurrency market in 2024 and beyond. Pal highlighted a critical factor that many investors overlook, global liquidity conditions. In a recent discussion with Blockworks Macro, Pal explained that liquidity is a major driver of every crypto bull market and he believes we are at the cusp of significant improvement in liquidity conditions, which could trigger an immediate increase in asset prices. While Pal expects most asset classes to perform well over the next 12 to 18 months, he predicts that cryptocurrencies and digital assets will outperform them all. He foresees massive liquidity injections from central banks worldwide in the coming weeks, leading to what he describes as the much-anticipated banana zone. Describe. Stop. You don't have time. Don't miss out this 2025 bull run. Educate yourself first ahead of the crowd. We have created the ultimate step-by-step -step crypto cheat guide that will guide you this bull run. Unlock the secrets of crypto and make smarter investments today. Now by clicking on the link below to get your exclusive copy just under $10. As I've been talking about for a while, I think we're in that transition from macro crypto spring into macro crypto summer. Now people confuse it with the actual season itself. I just saw that on Twitter. I'm like, no, no, no. It's because it breaks down to four periods of the liquidity cycle that drives assets. So the transition here is usually when the forces are still disinflationary and growth is slow to picking up. That is like macro utopia. Why? Because that tends to push the central banks into adding liquidity and the governments to adding liquidity. It also happens to be this everything code cycle is also about the election cycle. And guess what politicians do at this time as well? They want to give candy to the kids. So they're stimulating as well and tend to stimulate into the following year as well. So that particular juncture of the macro starting to pick up, the ISM survey is still below 50. So it's still sluggish. The forward-looking indicators are all very positive and liquidity has been positive for a while. That pickup, if you think of it, we've had a Wall Street recovery, which is liquidity. Main Street recovery is yet to happen. Main Street is when earnings go up and all of our earnings go up and there's a bit more money around. That's when the flows from all of these earnings start going into markets as well. So it's not just liquidity and debasement driving things, it gets driven by actual investment money, which has been actually quite lacking in many respects. So that's typical of, of the crypto summer. So the crypto summer starts around now, it also forms the basis of the banana zone, um, and that's when things start to get really crazy. If we go back and look at all of these since about 2008, they've all done roughly the same thing, which is presidential election cycle. It kind of has a sell-off into the summer. Then it tends to accelerate sideways over the election because everyone doesn't know what it means. And then it's all over, markets rip, whatever the outcome. A shock, you know, expected result doesn't matter. 
And so that election cycle has been very prevalent, both in equities and in crypto. So that's where we are in the cycle now. So we're just in that zone of, you know, we've got this beautiful chart pattern that is just consolidating. The stuff that has less network traction or network adoption has fallen significantly, but we're starting to see the recovery. So I think it's it's only a matter of time now before we start to see the next move. And that that's also likely to coincide with some other liquidity things. I think the Japanese have to intervene with the blessing of the Fed, because that's going to help the Chinese, the Japanese, everybody's business cycle. That has to come um, because the, current, the US dollar is far too strong for this point in the cycle. The other thing that needs to happen alongside that is the Fed absolutely have to cut. And I saw you talking on Twitter today. Look, inflation, the true inflation numbers are 1.82. You know, core inflate, core CPI is, is now headed lower sharply, but rates are at five and a half. It makes no sense considering the lag that it has. If not, they're going to under undershoot inflation, which I don't think they mind because you can refi debt at lower levels because they put everything at the short end right now. You know, Janet Yellen's been issuing short end debt. <laughs> so the lower she gets rates down, the more she can get back into the four year cycle. The Fed only operate on two things, unemployment and inflation. Both of those lag the business cycle itself. So unemployment, um, owner equivalent rents part of CPI, which is the large part of it, all of that stuff lags by 15 to 18 months. So even where the ISM today is bottoming, that means that that doesn't bottom until next year sometime, which is why the Fed are always cutting into the second year, because they're following the lagging indicators, the things that drive down CPI, which is why they're always late tightening. Powell is confident that the Federal Reserve's hawkish stance is primarily due to the lagging indicators it relies on. He points to unemployment as an example, noting it typically lags by about 12 months. Recent reports indicate that first-time applications for U.S. unemployment benefits increased in June, and the number of people on jobless rolls also rose, suggesting a gradual cooling in the labor market. This, combined with lower inflation data, is fueling market optimism that the Fed might start cutting rates this year, possibly as soon as September. Joe McCann, the founder, CEO, and CIO of Asymmetric, a crypto-focused hedge fund, suggests that an emergency rate cut of 25 to 50 basis points by the Fed during the next FOMC meeting on July 30th to 31st would not be entirely surprising if unemployment and other indicators either worsen or show further improvement before then. This potential rate cut has the markets hopeful, and prices could improve significantly. Returning to Powell's interview, he discusses further insights into the cryptocurrency industry and the $100 trillion opportunity it presents. What we've got here is a global utility, which is blockchain much like the internet was. Now, unlike any of these global utility networks, trains, road systems, all of this, you couldn't invest in them. But because this is tokenized, you've got a behavioral incentive system to grow the network, mm -hmm. which is the more people come onto the network, the more the number go up, the more people come on the network. And therefore, the more capital in the network, the more applications get built, the more the network gets used, right? It's, it's genius. And we've never seen anything like this, where we're all part of it. So here we've got this asset class, which is a globally homogenous asset, which doesn't exist. Gold is the only one. But gold, if you go to a village in India, the bid offer spread is 50%. Here we've got tradable on a mobile phone in India, the Philippines, Fiji, New York, Vancouver, the Cayman Islands, the same thing. And it happens to be the infrastructure layer to the internet for the system, for the for value and storage. And you know, it's that distributed database, which is a public service utility good. Okay, brilliant. It's a $2.5 trillion market cap today. If we just extrapolate out the trend rate of growth, it gets to $100 trillion by about 2032. Okay, so this is the biggest wealth drop generating opportunity in all human history. So you've got this in front of you, which is this whole, how to un my future, part of it is this. The other thing is don't this up, never get thrown off this horse. Because this is the one, this is the big one. This is the greatest macro gift of all time to get everybody out of this shit that they're in. So it's there in front of you. So then people are like, yeah, but what do I invest in? I'm like, okay, listen, detune all the noise. There's a bunch of decentralized businesses that sell block space. And they all have different types of block space. One's going, hey, mine's the most secure and the oldest. Somebody else is like, well, mine's the internet computer. And somebody's like, mine's the internet computer, but faster. They're just selling block space. So there's a bunch of companies selling block space or applications on top of that block space. That's all the space is. It's just a technology and it's an adoption. So our job within this 
is now not get philosophical and tribal about where do I invest in that technology and screw it up. Our job is to maximize the opportunity to the best we can. And that's a balance of how do you take risk? Because a lot of people go, max 10 risk. Like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Look, if it's going for two and a half trillion to 100 trillion, you don't need to take max risk. You can just capture the bulk and then do a bit of the tail on the side. This is a narrative-driven attention space. And so they just want what they can do. I made it very clear all the way through, hey, 90% of my liquid net worth is basically allocated right now to Solana. I moved some from ETH. I don't have much Bitcoin right now. Doesn't mean I don't like Bitcoin. I just think the others go up more. Simple as that. I own a bunch of high-end NFTs that I think I have another thesis about. And then beyond that, um, I do a bit of speculation and other stuff. But the fun of it. But the time horizon thing is I can see it freaks everybody out. And I've stepped back and it was only in the last two weeks I've realized the risk, the, the, the real thing that's going on on crypto Twitter and why the banana zone resonates and why you get this backlash is this is everybody's hopes and dreams. It's, it's everywhere. It's yours. It's mine. It's everybody's. Right. So they're so scared of it going wrong, yet they're some, so greedy to get it right. This is the struggle that everybody's having. And people have PTSD from the last cycle, as the people did from the previous cycle. Right, The previous cycle was the blow off top, and then the collapse. This one was the stunted top, and then the collapse. And so now people, they worry about the cycle. Mm-hmm. I don't remember Jeff Bezos caring about the business cycle. He just owned his stock. In other news, the International Monetary Fund has advised the Federal Reserve to maintain current interest rates until at least late 2024 and to strengthen its fiscal position by cutting spending and increasing revenues. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva shared this recommendation last week while speaking in Washington, D.C. We expect core PC inflation to end this year around 2.5%. She began, and to be back to target by mid-2025. That said, we do recognize important upside risks to this path. Given those risks, we agreed that the Fed should keep policy rates at current levels until at least late 2024. It's worth noting that the IMF had previously warned that the Fed's aggressive rate hikes could negatively impact other economies worldwide. What do you think about this sudden shift in the IMF's stance? When do you believe the Fed is most likely to start cutting rates? Please share your thoughts and comments on Pal's interview in the section below. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.